I think uh, uh, everyone should be back in the main uh, meeting room. So uh, before we start with the next next uh, um, lecture, I'd uh, uh, just I'd like to um, say a few reminder about uh, a few information about the school. So uh, please uh, remind to check uh, frequently the the uh, program on the ICTP website, especially the program of next week is uh, changing uh, rapidly. And uh, next week, beyond uh, other lectures, we are going to also have uh, round tables uh, with the discussions among uh, speakers uh, that can also be participated by you. And uh, um, the other point I wanted to make is that next Thursday, uh, the 16th, there is going to be a colloquium, an ICTP colloquium by uh, Professor Ned Wingreen, uh, which will be live streamed on YouTube and uh, can be followed on Zoom. But for that, if you want to follow on Zoom and ask questions, you have to, since it's a separate event, you have to register. So you find all the information on the ICTP website. Great. So um, the next uh, uh, slot is a QA and a session, like the one we uh, had uh, earlier. And uh, uh, in this respect, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the next lecturer, James O'Dwyer. James is a professor in the plant biology department at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, um, his research, research is focused on modeling and analyzing complex uh, ecological community, combining data and theory. So he pre-recorded two lectures on uh, cooperation, stability, and uh, resilience. Uh, so what uh, I'm going to do now is to leave the floor to James and uh, leave the floor to uh, you as well to ask questions. So uh, please, if you have any question about the pre-recorded lectures, uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, type it in the chat or raise hand. Okay. So we have a question by uh, Washington, please. Yeah, hi James, I enjoyed your lectures quite a bit. Very interesting stuff. Um, I got a bunch of questions. Maybe I'll just uh, throw a couple of questions at you that were things you commented on that I wasn't sure I fully understood what you meant. One was, you said that um, in your models, you weren't really depending on, or it didn't really matter whether you chose a random distribution for the interactions. I mean, you had the luck of Volterra and then you also had the separate resource business. Yeah, yeah. Can you, so what, the first question is, can you say a little bit more about whether you use random interactions or what you use there? And I'll just ask the second question you can. <clears throat> and the second question is you made a comment about being able to integrate out the resources and get a generalized luck of Volterra model with some extra terms for the other things. And, yeah. and the second is, whether the resources actually have independent trajectories, so those would be like hidden variables and some time dependencies, or whether it's something simpler than that. Yeah, super, super interesting questions. Thank you very much for the questions, Washington. Uh, so let me, uh, the first one, uh, as you probably know, and I know other lectures have, uh, lecturers have talked about it, the, many of those classic Locke Volterra results do rely on results for the eigenvalue spectra of random matrices. So that, that uh, I'm not disputing. The, what, my comment there was, but it's a, but it's a restriction, right? Because that, that may not, they're certainly not telling you about every possible block of Altera system, right? That's for sure. Um, if you fine tune the interactions, you could get uh, not any spectrum you want, but you could certainly violate those gen general rules for stability. So my comment was about uh, the consumer resource models in contrast to that. And so there are, matrices obviously involved there that you saw in the lectures like in that and i think with, with the with the additional layer of mechanism there be, there comes more choices to make so there's there's many different versions of those consumer resource models which is one issue but in the version i showed in the lecture where you have substitutable resources with some preferences for those resources and you have um some production or returning of resources to the common pool there are two matrices there right the, the c matrix and the p matrix as i was terming them and our results about stability uh, there are definitely some assumptions along the way to get the strongest analytical results we have to assume things like um equal abundances for the different taxa but but we can still get a range of results weakening those kinds of assumptions but what we don't ever have to assume is that um the C and P matrices are typical of a random draw. So they could be literally anything you want, 
so that, that this for the results that we 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 can prove. So that the C matrix could be uh, just diagonal, which is one of the cases I, I, I looked at in slightly more detail. So you, you'd specialize on one resource, or it could be could be random, could be some mixture of uh, specialism, and then some off diagonal elements might be random. So you have some additional ability to use other resources, but it really doesn't matter for for the results that we looked at. So that what I was trying to say was that. You know, it's not the whole story, and there are there are there are some things that we 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 don't have a handle on in that consumer resource framework. But one nice thing is that we don't have to make that assumption about the random matrices to get to get to the the results. The, the results about you know, now understanding the the structure of the whole spectrum would be another question. We don't know that, but just saying whether it's um, stable or not, we we can say without making those kind of assumptions. But just to clarify, I mean, you're not saying it's true for every possible CMP set of matrices, right? So every possible set, set of CMP matrices within some, so there are some constraints, like, for example, um, they have to be positive. Um, the P matrix, the way I formulated that model was such that the diagonal was zero. So you weren't recycling into, um, you know, uh, well, in, in, the, in the case of the specialist matrix, I, I actually think maybe more generally, even the diagonal could be non-zero, but there are some constraints on the P and C matrix for it to make biological sense. Other than that, no. I see. Very interesting. So you're saying it's a very general result, independent. Yeah, it's it in that respect. Yes. That now I won't um, sort of um, say there aren't a lot of assumptions going in there because even building the structure of that model is is making if, if you like more assumptions than Locke of Volterra, and. Uh, I can give you one flavor of where, where um, even though exactly as you say that the results I presented are nicely very general. I'll give you an example of, of a flavor of something which is sort of not exactly covered up, but something that's not maybe immediately obvious. So one uh, one assumption I made, and I did state it in the lecture, but the benefit I derive from a resource in the model I showed you is the is proportional to the rate at which I deplete that same resource. So if I'm eating something, I'm growing in proportion to that. But of course, that doesn't have to be the case. I could degrade resources without caring about them. So I could take up resources and just dump them in some form which was unusable to me or anyone else without my population growing. And that's that's not implausible in the sense that um, you know there are examples of something of things of cases in real real ecological systems where that is to some extent the case, maybe not as extreme as that. And it also makes intuitive sense in that I could gain a competitive advantage if I just degrade the resource you use. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter to me that I can grow with it. So um, making that generalization, uh, you, you, you have a different set of results. That's something we haven't um, published yet, but, but I'm working on with uh, Theo, who's one of the grad students I mentioned, um, and an undergrad in my lab. But um, yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to, to add, the nuance I'm trying to add is that with the consumer resource models, there are a lot of choices to make before you even get to those equations. Once you get there, let C and P be whatever you want, we, as long as they are interpretable biologically. Cool. Uh, uh, second question was about integrating out, right? Integrating yes. out resources. So that's a great question. And uh, it has uh, it sort of bugged me for quite a long time uh, as I started to think about ecological questions many years ago. Uh, because you had things like, you, well, you had these two kind of parallel frameworks, right? Thinking about competition or interactions more generally, lock Volterra, and then adding that layer of mechanism. And, uh, and yeah, I'd certainly seen, and I learned more about it as I went on, seeing the statement that those, those two frameworks can be made equivalent by integrating out these additional um, degrees of freedom, the resources. So, but there, there are some subtleties there. Uh, so I, I, I wrote another paper a couple of years ago, which I didn't talk about in this talk, but trying to get at when can that be done exactly without, as you said, I think in your earlier formation of the question, the resources having their own independent trajectories or you know, being in independent degrees of freedom. And there are some cases where that's true. And you can probably guess that in those cases, there's got to be some kind of conserved quantity and that that you know so that the dynamics of something involving the consumers and something involving the resources turns out to have uh no time derivative and so in some models that is the case and so the simplest one 
the very simplest case would be um, one consumer and one resource. So th think of the resource as space. I uh, like there's some finite space I can occupy and I'm trying to, you know, as I reproduce, my population is growing and filling out that space. So then you could divide up that, um, you know, that, that space into a space which is filled by individuals in my population and then empty space that I'm able to expand into. And you could think of the, the empty space as an available resource, right? That's sort of you know, something I can take advantage of. You know, access to light, you could think about it literally as a, a advective resource. And, uh, but it, there's something conserved, right? Which is the total amount of space is fixed you know, if I'm not expanding it in some way. And so you could write down a consumer resource model for one consumer and the available space, uh, but then write down that the total occupied space, which would be the consumer population density, roughly, or population size, plus the available space, the resource, always is fixed. Integrate out the resource that way and you end up with logistic growth. So you could start off with something which looks like it's linear growth, for the consumer, but multiplied by the amount of available resource that's left, because you're going to grow more slowly if there are less patches left that you can go into. Looks linear, but you integrate out the resource because there is this conserved quantity, total space isn't changing. You get logistic growth where you know you saturate up to the total, the size of the field, right? Whatever it is. So that's a simple case where there's a conserved quantity, you can exactly integrate out the resource. Then there are, you could write down multivariable consumer models and multiple resources, uh, but it's certainly not trivial that there's going to be anything like that, any kind of conserved quantity. So that's, uh, but there are cases where, that, where that, that's true. And in those cases, you exactly can integrate out the resources. You have an exact description in terms of um, the, the consumer population sizes. I mean, it will not in general be Locke of Volterra, but it'll be something. So, so you're that's possible. If you have as many algebraic equations as you have resources, you can basically solve for the resources and just eliminate them from the equation. Exactly, exactly. But that's rare. So that that, you know, that system is integrable in some respect, and uh, but that's not typical. But mm -hmm. th there, the, the cases which are more talked about, or at least um, you know, when I first started reading about in ecology, the kind of uh, canonical way of thinking about it would be, okay, that's probably not always going to be the case, typically. Mm -hmm. that there's some exactly conserved you know, some number of exactly conserved quantities uh but that the there is a, a thought that maybe um resources would be uh, like fast moving would approach their equilibrium values quickly and mm -hmm. so in those if 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 you if you buy that idea then um the, the approach would be basically to set the, all of the dr by dt's on the left hand sides of the resource equations equal to zero and solve the other sides algebraically. That's not going to be an exact, that's not going to be exactly, um, that won't match the true numerical solution, say, of those ODEs. Uh, it, it may match it certainly close to the equ an equilibrium if you linearize the system and say there is a group of eigenvalues which is very. Um, uh, large and negative and then a group which is very small and negative so you'll have some sub, slow and fast directions and then the full generalization of that um, result I guess would be some of the it's very hard to get a handle on at least I mean it's certainly not obvious how to get a handle on it but you you might think about the full dynamical system more generally so you've got some space of consumers and resources so like living in r to the 2n I guess if there's n consumers and n resources Suppose you're at some arbitrary point in this space, so you're not near equilibrium, and you want to know, could, could I approximate this by, you know, just a model of consumers? I think that's in very, very much in general not going to be true. But what you could imagine is quite plausible is that maybe quite quickly the dynamics relax to a slow manifold and then kind of cruise in on that lower dimensional manifold to the equilibrium. Now that manifold is in general going to be some nonlinear shape presumably because you're not linearized obviously near and even if you were linearizing the equilibrium it could still be a linear combination of consumers and resources it just just so happens that for the typical models people write down most of the fast eigenvalues tend to be overlapping the resource eigenvectors uh, or you know the, sorry the uh, the eigenvectors corresponding to the fast eigenvalues tend to overlap the um resource vectors if you like the resource directions but they don't have to and certainly i think as you get further away from the equilibrium it's 
you know, it's not obvious that slow manifold is just going to be well described by trajectory of the consumers alone. Uh, but I think there's some interesting open scope there to understand, uh, yeah, what happens far away from equilibrium where you simply can't just set dr by dt equal to zero. So yeah, so three ways to answer your question. One is rarely you might have enough algebraic equations to eliminate resources. In that case, and there's there's one at least very simple example where that's true and sort of plausible with one consumer, but going to be rarer in general. Two, you can kind of say if you're near equilibrium and the spectrum looks the right way, you can more or less ignore the resource dynamics. If you're further away from equilibrium, I think it's plausible that there may be still separations in time scales, but it's much harder to get a handle on exactly, um, you know, who is undergoing the interesting slower dynamics. Does that, does that answer your thanks. question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. And thanks again for the nice talk. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Great, there are, um, there is a question from Ankit. Uh, hi. Ankit. Yeah, hi, uh, a very interesting set of lectures. Uh, so like based on this, what I could gather was uh, that like in such bacterial communities, since you also have this additional goods production, so to say, that sort of like brings down the competition. And like in general, uh, Lotka Volterra, we usually think of interaction matrices and like we directly write down competition terms for like between species. But here, like there's no direct sense of competition. Like it's through like mediated through resources and goods production. But like, yeah. is there any way of uh, like looking at different levels of competition, like maybe as a mixture of uh, resources and goods production, uh, which could give you like some limits to the stability of the system? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So yeah, you're absolutely right that it, I, I went from a picture where the interactions were pairwise, i.e. Locke Volterra, whether it was competition or you could write down mutualistic interactions by just changing the signs, right, in the inter-specific interactions. And I went from there directly to a, a system where uh, it was consumption and production of resources. Uh, but so a couple of points about that that I would I would make. One is uh, if you go back, I mean, and not that it's not intuitive anyway, but it's certainly if you even go back to the Locke of Volterra papers on competition, the interpretation was often written down in terms of resources, right? That these uh, competition coefficients would be large if there was a substantial overlap in the kinds of resources that two species use. So, so I think, so what I'm getting at is, yeah, the competition becomes indirect. There's no direct competition anymore in the consumer resource models, and there's no direct pairwise mutualistic interaction. It's mediated by, I'm producing something that you can use. So it is indirect, but that interpretation was probably always underlying even those pairwise models. You know, so from a certain point of view, people probably thought about those pairwise models and still do as an approximation to a more indirect process. That would be one interpretation. But let, let me answer your question in a different way as well. And that is, at least in principle, and probably, you know, you, you can identify cases in practice where competition, well, when I teach competition in, in, in a class, you do have different kinds of competition and some, and so the classically you might separate out into some which look more like resource overlap and some which do look more like direct interactions between individuals, right? And it could be a territorial interaction or something like this. So now ultimately those are probably for competition for resources. So territory would be what an example, right? But nevertheless, it could play out in terms of more direct pairwise interactions between individuals. So in other words, th there is a difference potentially in the dynamics of we're in the same location and I happen to get forage for something before you do. There's a difference between that and me kind of pushing you out, right? So, so I think you're, you're, it's, a, it's a great question that you could easily imagine layering on top of the consumer resource models that I wrote down and that other people obviously work on as well. You could layer on top of that a direct interaction. There'll be no reason not to. And, and you're right also that it would like it would certainly change the dynamics and 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 very probably the stability properties. So I think there's no reason not to do that. And there are probably many situations where species are competing 
both indirectly for resources and maybe directly in terms of um, you know direct pairwise interaction. So so I guess what I'm saying is one interpretation lock of Volterra competition really is just an approximation to resource acquisition. But another interpretation is well, it maybe really accounts for those direct pairwise cases where two individuals really are interacting directly with each other. And um, I don't think there's any reason not to put the two together. I have, I have not done that, but it would be kind of interesting to see what the outcome would be. Interesting, thanks. Wait, there is a, a question from Pablo, please. Hi, Pablo. Hello, James. Um, thank you for your lectures. They were really interesting. So my question Great. is um, related to the one Washington had. Um, I'm working with the Marsland model, which you probably are familiar with. Um, and random matrix theory is really interesting, but it has one problem that if you're not able to um, analytically find the equilibrium, you can't do anything. Um, and this is the problem with the Marsland model. Even if I do um, time scale separation and I assume that mm. research dynamics are fast, um, I'm not able to find a, a, a stable solution for the resources. And therefore, I'm not able to find an analytical solution for the equilibrium of the populations. Uh, so I was wondering if you have faced this problem, because I see that you've done random matrix theory with consumer resource model where you have uh, cross feeding. Um, and what, what are the type of assumptions, uh, that if you can detail that, that you do in order for you to, to get analytical um, equilibrium, or if you have faced this problem in this particular model, uh, do you have any ideas on how to tackle it? Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, thanks for the question, Pablo. Uh, couple, of, couple of points. So, um, to the extent I use random matrix theory in these models related to Washington's question, it's to provide examples rather than a necessary element. In other words, you know, just, just to give a, a numerical examples, in, in some cases we chose that consumer, the consu consumer preferences were um, you know, drawn from a random distribution, drawn, drawn from a distribution. Uh, but now let me also th point out that um, there are a couple of things. One is, uh, so the um, Robert Marsland and collaborators, of course, the, the model that they have developed, which is in, it's sort of very similar to the most general model I wrote down in production in one of my slides. And then I simplified to a different model, which um, is maybe a little bit easier to analyze in some respects. But the, the more general model allows for the production of resources by me to depend on the resources that are available to me. And that's very plausible. And it's, it's probably the, the right way to, well, <laughs> I'm giving myself a lot of parentheses here to get back to. Let me just say for production of resources as a byproduct of metabolism to depend on the resources around me makes total sense, right? Because if I eat burgers, maybe my byproducts are different than if I eat um, apples and pears, right? So that, that, that makes total sense. And, but it adds an extra layer of you know, difficulty in analyzing those models. So, um, uh, the, the way that we formulated production of resources is probably more easily interpreted as a kind of recycling process. So following mortality, that there's some characteristic composition of a cell of each taxon, and some of it is returned to the common pool. So there are differences. I guess that's my main point in saying uh, that, that describing those um, details of the of Robert Marsland's model and what I talked about in detail, but I also totally buy that allowing to make allowing for production to be more generally dependent on the resources around me makes sense. So, um, in terms of analytical solutions of the model I presented, they're relatively straightforward. Just involve kind of matrix inversions and nothing nothing overly complicated. That may become more complicated the the, the more um, involved you make the production term for sure. So that there's no guarantee, right? There's no guarantee that you're going to always be able to even, so I mean, you, you have algebraic equations, right? If you're looking for equilibria, so they're certainly simpler than solving the dynamics, but there's no guarantee you'll have a nice form or, or, and certainly there's no guarantee of having a stable equilibrium. So I wonder, and I don't know this for sure, but certainly in, in the models that we have looked at and that I talked about, there are certainly regimes in which you won't find 
the resources settling to an equilibrium. These are precisely the cases where there are instabilities, right? So I don't know if that is relate, related to what you're seeing. And the stability properties of the Marsden model are, di are different in some respects. So it depends on the details of how you're implementing that. But certainly what we find is that there are regimes of resource inflow and obviously depending on the structure of the consumer preferences and the production of resources, there are regimes where there won't be a stable positive equilibrium. And so if you were to solve those equations numerically, which we did just to show what it looks like, you get some kind of limit cycle and it doesn't, it's not, yeah, that's something which I, you know, I don't understand fully the properties of what does happen to the dynamics when those equilibria become unstable. But um, yeah, in, in our models, what, seems to be key is the level of resource inflow for determining that and so there are some regimes of resource inflow in coupled to the you know the structure of the the preferences and the production matrix there are some regimes where you won't find stable solutions and somewhere you will so i don't know if that's what's maybe happening in in the solutions you're looking at that there actually isn't a positive stable equilibrium it could be that or um you know maybe it's just hard to, to put to find uh, your solution in a nice form. Ah, and what, one other point I wanted to make was in the second lecture of mine that, 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 uh, that um, is part of the school, uh, I talked about uh, what we called uh, metabolically informed community dynamics. And there, you know, what I was really trying to get at, it was a paper with Mario Muscarella, who, who was in my lab at the time. What we were trying to get at was okay, we do know that the production of resources is going to often depend on the resources I take up. The, the, the point I'm making about the Mars and model being a bit different from the, what I, I talked about in lecture one. But, um, but what should that look like? You know, I think there's a bit of guesswork involved in formulating these consumer resource models. And that goes back also to a point that came up in response to Washington's question. It, it, you have many more choices to make. There are these different flavors of consumer resource and production models. And so what I wanted to get at in that second lecture was, okay, can we, um, can we narrow down the possibilities? Can we understand whether there are, you, you, you know, what, what is, what are the most plausible ways for production of resources to depend on uh, the resources I'm taking up? Uh, you know, cause you could write down you, know, you could write down more and less plausible functions, but it, I mean, there's nothing really uh, stopping you from writing down some arbitrary, horrible function of uh, resources and um, you know how, and different metabolic pathways, and and that that could be very plausible, even if it's horrific, right? And so that that was the idea of that second talk and that paper was to begin to think about um, what uh, yeah, what are the most plausible can we from something like first principles derive what those production um, matrices should look like or could look like uh, or constrain what they could look like so um yeah maybe part of what you're seeing is just that there's many ways to formulate these resource consumption and production models they're not all guaranteed to have nice closed form solutions for sure for the equilibria they're not all guaranteed in it, well, in any of the ones we've looked at, to have stable positive equilibria, and the uh, to cap it all, you know, we we don't really know exactly what the right formulation of these models is. So there's a lot of question marks there. So I'm really answering your question with a bunch of questions, but hopefully that's at least adjacent to what you're you're thinking about. Thank you. I think it was a very nice set of questions as an answer. Uh, <laughs> there is a question by Martina. Hi, Martina. Hello, James. Um, so I, I have a question that is related to what you were saying just three seconds ago. So how do you think you, so these metabolic informed models, so how do you think they scale when you add more resources that you produce? Uh, and whether you can, I don't know, uh, make the what you produce changing in time depending on whether you are in the exponential phase the lag phase so uh yeah i mean yeah yeah it basically <laughs> does does it yeah that's, I, I think i get the question but uh, and it, but if i didn't re-ask it again if i'm answering totally the wrong thing um so that metabolically informed model 
it's a really simple model of what's happening inside a cell, right? That's that's kind of I think what you're getting at. It's just uh, two, yeah, or I guess three resources involved basically in in each intracellular process. So two things coming in, an interaction between them, and something comes out at the end, and then that's excreted by the cell. So. Uh, how does that scale when you have more resources involved? And so let, let me say back to you how I'm uh, understanding the question and maybe I'll give you a chance just to say if I'm on the right lines. So I think you're asking, well, in any real cell, the, the processes are more complicated. They, they will involve um, discrete changes, like maybe processes being switched on and switched off in response to what cells are sensing externally and so there could be you know the, these it could be a lag phase or something like this or yeah as a, as a cell switches between resources um there could also be many different uh well there will be many different resources and other molecules involved in these processes inside the cell i think you're asking how much of what we see in that really simplified model could possibly carry over in that more general picture. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, actually I was thinking uh, more about what happens in the cell, uh, what, which is related to what happens in the cell, but is, uh, so you start from glucose, but you produce 30 other metabolites uh, and yeah. more or less the cell excretes, I don't know, 20 of them, uh, because you have uh, the uh, metabolic overflow or you have uh, all these molecules are, can, diffuse passively outside the, the membrane. So the question was, okay, if I start from glucose, do you think you can scale uh, your processes to account for, I don't know, more metabolites that, that are produced? Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, the- Yeah, that's a great, great question. And that's an easier question to answer because the answer is yes, I think. That 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 side of things is much easier to scale, right? That, okay. that, that um, they, they, you know, there, there may be different, you know, obviously ratios or proportions of those metabolites produced, but the functional forms will be pretty similar. So scaling on that side is pretty nice. If there's you know, many, many outputs and they can diffuse passively across the cell wall and then are put into the common pool, that, that works nicely in that same framework and will look very similar. I mean, but like you say, I know this is relevant to your work as well. Um, the uh, that, that will make a big difference to the community dynamics, for sure. And you're right, and, and of course, to make the full contact with what I talked about in the first lecture, where you have many consumers and many resources, that's certainly one way to get there, one plausible way to get there with the metabolically informed model is to have these multiple metabolites produced, and that could lead to a really rich set of community dynamics, and we didn't really get there in that, in that first paper with Mario. You know, so that's an interesting, there's scope for interesting development there, for example, to say, if you have uh, those, maybe um, you keep the input, the, the, the essential resources relatively simple for each taxon, but you have a wide range of outputs, but following the kinds of functional forms that we, we, we talked about, uh, I, it would be really interesting to understand what that changes about the dynamics and the stability and the equilibria and so on. I think that would be really interesting as a comparison with all the stuff in the first lecture. We haven't, just haven't got there yet. It's, you know, 2020 happened basically. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question and it is easier to tackle than the other way around. Now, the other way around would be you know, if, you, if there are many kind of like essential resources that get involved in some, you know, some way in the overall set of pathways that lead to those many metabolites. I think that's, a, that's not uh, an impossible question to answer. That's the scaling up of that side, but it's, but it at least is harder. And a, a question to me that I don't really have a good handle on is how to systematically uh, pare down the, you know, the true complexity of that metabolism and, and, and to, to a point where you can say, these results are robust. I don't think it's implausible that, I mean, look, ecologists have been looking at these relatively simplified dynamics this whole time, right, for decades. So we've been had this guesswork about how the internals of not just uh, single celled organisms, but uh, more, uh, but multicellular, more complex organisms, how the internals affect um, 
ecological dynamics, right? Behavior it would be, uh, it, you know, maybe underexplored in terms of its impact on population and, and community dynamics, but certainly is something people think about a lot. So I guess what I'm saying is it's not implausible to me that those internal dynamics can boil down to something manageable, but also we have not at all proved that in, in that paper. But the other way around, producing many outputs, I think is, 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 is much more doable and, 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 and not at all uninteresting. It would be very interesting to see how that affects stability and dynamics for larger communities. One, one more thing I wanted to say, sorry if I'm just taking an opportunity to ramble, uh, but uh, you, your question is interesting and it's about this, again, additional layer of mechanism inside the cell. And I think it's just a super interesting question because it's not just about throwing more resources in and having more resources come out. It, I think it's also about, um, you know, what is that? You know, there may be other elements of the set of rules, but obviously there are other elements to the set of rules by which cells are operating. And how do we pare those down to the, you know, to, to at least uh, a simple enough model that we can extract robust results for the community dynamics. So I think, um, I've se so I've seen a few other, you know, few other approaches to thinking about that. Um, you know, there's like, there's papers from Terry Hua's group, which go back many years, um, looking at uh, apportionment of resources inside the cell to different categories of process. That's an, in my mind, it's, it's conceptually similar. It's a way of, you know, a simplified model of the internals of the cell, which then can give rise to different community dynamics at the, you know, at this larger scale. And the, the cell wall, of course, kind of provides you this, somewhat a natural separation of scales, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, I think it's just an, it, the answer to your question is, I think some of it can be scaled up. The more general answer in my mind is, is another question, which is how do we systematically um, show what kinds of community dynamics are robust or the most likely outcomes of whatever is going on in the cell? And that's, that's, a, that's a harder question, but I think it's super interesting. Thank you. Thanks for the um, answer. Uh, so is there any other uh, question? I don't see any, any um, hand raised in the, uh, in the list, but please, uh, we have time for more uh, questions and answers. Um, or if you want, don't want to uh, talk, you can uh, type it in the chat. It has been pretty intense so far. So, uh, ah, there is another question from Washington. Please yeah, if no one else is asking questions, I'll ask another one. Yes. Um, so have you, or uh, when, you, when you think about resources, I gather you're primarily thinking about like physiological resources, like material resources, like phosphate and things like that. Um, have you thought about how energy as a resource fits into that? Or do you, are you aware of other work where people have looked at sort of energy flow in systems like this? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, yeah, there there are there are papers so, and approaches to thinking about uh, communities or maybe more ecosystem dynamics in terms of energy flows and you know, thermodynamic properties more generally of ecological communities. There is a whole um, you know not not field but like. Uh, approach of thinking about, um, I, I don't know if, if you are familiar with the, in non-equilibrium system mechanics, but people have proposed maximizing entropy as a principle, not proven, but just as a, maybe mm -hmm. as a guideline. So there's, there's definitely people thinking about whether ecological systems change over time in order to maximize entropy production. And so, you know, obviously that's not just the energy, but it's sort of thinking about the system more thermodynamically, maybe, which is along maybe along the lines of what you're you're wondering. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if if I mean for the kinds of things we're looking at here. I mean, the the resources. I guess that it, I can't think of a way they would not have an energetic value as such. I think all the things we're thinking about, whether that's light capture, or it's um, 
you know, eating glucose and kind of uh, using that to derive energy. I mean, they're all, energy I think is inevitably involved, obviously, um, but... Good, you're saying that some of the resources being passed include energy as a component and others contain other crucial nutrients and things. So it's, 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 it's in some sense implicit, in some sense implicit in what you're doing that energy would be one of the features involved. But that's right, that's right. And I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, I like the, the, the work I just referenced, you know, just thinking about the, these sort of, if you like, coarser grained pictures of how ecosystems are working and the flows of energy and other thermodynamic properties. So I'm not saying I don't like that stuff and I'm interested in it, but it will be, you know, part of what we're thinking about here is what happens as a level of, for example, um, as, uh, so you could imagine that the substitutable resources may be all uh, forms of organic carbon, you know, and so there are some other, you know, resources which are less uh, energetically useful, which may be essential, but we could sort of ignore those and just say, well, carbon is sort of the limiting resource in a given context, maybe. Uh, and so then, you know, what we're interested in here comes down to more exactly looking at the differences between those different forms of energy, if you like. So mm -hmm. calling those, you know, collapsing down that matrix to uh, to just energy could be kind of reductive, right? Because you wouldn't. So, for example, many of the uh, not many, but several of the talks in the school I've thought about, and the, and and mine too, in a way, think about coexistence, right, of many different kinds of species. So, uh, not that that entirely relies on differentiation of resource use, but it, it can do, right? And so mm -hmm. you'd sort of lose that. You know, and, and, but which is fine for depending on the question, right? Because you actually maybe you want to lump all heterotrophs into a category, right? And then you're thinking about a much bigger cycle of just you know, autotrophs, heterotrophs, decomposers, or something like something like this. And in that case, those kind of coarser flows of energy might be the right language to use. But maybe, maybe the right way to answer your question is it, it probably just depends on the question of interest. And if your question of interest is understanding communities of many different species doing slightly different things, you know, but kind of at the large scale, kind of maybe they're doing slightly different things in sort of boring, boringly, right? They're not vastly mm -hmm. different. Then, uh, you know, the, the language of the, these kinds of resources is probably the right language. But if you're interested in those sort of larger scale flows of uh, energy and, and, you know, you might think about just flows of nutrients like C and N and P rather than specific forms of them. Yeah, then that, that would be a sort of different language to use maybe for different kinds of questions. Cool, thanks. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, James. So we have space for more questions if uh, anyone wants to ask. Really good questions, by the way. Thanks everyone for the yes. for, for watching the lectures and for the great questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I mean, it was very, very interesting. Um, so, if uh, there are no more questions, what I would say is that we can uh, move to the uh, breakout rooms, and James can stay, uh, let's say, other fifteen minutes with us, and uh, you you are free to chat uh, informally in the breakout rooms. I just as a technical reminder. If you have a Zoom version that is